Is it on? Yes, it is. Okay. You can tell who the excited one is. <laughs> so. Anybody out there named Mike? Raise your hand. Just want to do a mic check. Mic check. Mic <laughs> check. Can you hear me? Is it close enough? All okay. right. So I, we are so glad that you're here today. We started to get nervous when they dismissed the kids. Half the church left. <laughs> but but they, they stayed here. And last week at the end of service, Pastor Chris was talking about this week, getting a different perspective. Sometimes we need different perspectives, and he thought you've heard him long enough. And So today, you're actually going to get two perspectives. My wife will explain that more. If you were here, the last time I was up here, I left the platform. Uh, I got sidetracked. I forgot about my dog. Anybody remember his name? Repent. repent. My dog, Repent. Uh, Jack Russ, he ran off. I had to go find him, and I did find him. He, he was outside. He was, he was hiding. He just had a brain lapse. He did not want to call when I came him, and it came called him. And he's just kind of like uh, sometimes we get a, a mind of our own, and we just forget where we were. In reality, he was hiding from reality. Sometimes, like we do, and he needed to be brought back home. And all of us, at some time or another, have wandered away and had to come back. But today we're here together, and we're going to continue talking about the things in this book, highlighted in this book. And there are so many different books that have been written about the subject of hiding from reality, who we are, or whatever. And this week, we're going to cover that, hiding from reality. Over the last several weeks, Pastor Chris has taught amazingly on different things out of the book. What first one was, What? Me offended? Impossible. The second week was massive offense, which all of us have been offended at some time or another by someone. The third week was, how could it happen to me? How could I allow this? How could they offend me? The fourth week was the father wounds, the wounds of a father, of a leader, of a mentor. And last week was spiritual vagabond moving from one place to another, never really settling down and learning. And this week, we're moving on to hiding from reality. Now, the question is to ask, what is reality? And depending on what subject you're talking about or what part of life you're in, it can be many different things. But today, we're going to focus on his word is reality. His word is truth. It is steadfast. And sometimes we will take it, we want to twist it with our own mind, our own circumstances, not to uh, accept it, but God still wants to talk to us. So, from reality, we can run, we can hide, but no matter where we go, it is right there with us. Because sometimes we just form our own reality. We get it in our minds, what we think, what we want, what we want to do. And I'm sure that... Most of you in this room have heard real life stories about someone that has committed a crime, a, a vicious crime or whatever, and they're running from the law, and while they're running, their life changes, and they get married, they have families, they have children, they have a new job, a new identity, and then one day there's a knock on the door, and it's the law enforcement coming to arrest someone, and the spouse and the children are like, what is going on? Because when they came, they were hiding from their own personal reality, running from the truth onto somewhere else. And it could have been by something they said, maybe a Facebook post by somebody took a picture, or it could be these days just DNA. But whatever it is, the person was living a life of deception, trying to hide themselves and who they really were. But that door, that knock will come to every one of us, no matter where we are. We, we have lived in a world of illusions. My wife and I have both lived there many years uh, during our marriage. And we started working together, going through books, learning. Who are we really? And I'm going to turn it over to her. Hi, I'm Virginia. I don't know if he introduced us. Uh, this Crystal, is Rick. Crystal introduced this us. This is Virginia. And would you pray? Oh, absolutely. That's the first thing we should do. We should open in prayer. So, Father, thank you for this body. Thank you for the people here today. 
Lord, each one of us in our life, we need you. We need your direction. We need your love. We need your looking at us, Lord, that we can see ourselves through your eyes, that we can grow, that we can mature, that we can live a life acceptable. And I do ask that you would anoint the words today, not the words that we speak, Lord, but the words we've heard from you and that you speak through us. I just pray for ears to be open, hearts to receive, and minds to take action. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I'm sure you've heard of uh, men being from Mars and women being from Venus. Well, this Martian of mine <laughs> thinks completely differently than I do, and when you have two people reading the same thing, you're going to get two different uh, outcomes. And so, like he said earlier, you'll get two different perspectives on this chapter, and I hope it's a blessing. As a linear thinker, I need to boil things down to the most simplest form. So I'll take something that I've read or studied or researched, and I'll boil it down to like one sentence. And so the one main point that I got from this chapter is that our spiritual maturity comes from obedience to God, period. One sentence. We must grow in our spiritual maturity, and that comes from our obedience once we get mature, this maturity allows us to live in reality rather than the world that we've created. And it affects how we respond to every situation, every relationship that we have in our lives. So that's clear enough, right? That's pretty simple. I've done a lot of research. I've been to, I'm an AA girl, Al-Anon, ACOA, Freedom Session, 12-step, you name it. I've done those, and entire books have been written on this one chapter. How do you take one chapter that is a plethora of information and make it so short? Well, we'll try. So I think his name is Bevere. Is that how we pronounce our author's name? He started with comparing the two Greek words for son or daughter. And you have the mature sons and the immature sons. You have your babies and your mature sons. Scripture also talks about moving toward maturity. In the New Living Translation in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it says, You've been believers for so long that you ought to be teaching one another. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God. As it goes to chapter 6, it says that, we're to go on instead to becoming mature in our understanding. And by the end of chapter 6, it boils everything down to loving, loving one another, loving God. And what's the first, in, the first commandment? That's right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's the second commandment? And I, I see that right here. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, in that is the entire law. So I think maturity has a lot to do with loving one another. Huh. But here's the truth, where we live, right? Here's the glitch. It's hard to love others when we're throwing tantrums to get our own way. It's mine. I want to do it my way. Well, Romans says, for if you live according to the flesh, how, how can you get away from your flesh? You live in it. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. But we have to define what are the deeds of the flesh then. And the Bible does not uh, try to hide what the deeds are. In Galatians 5.19, it lists a few. We have immorality, impurity, sensuality, covetousness, idolatry, sorcery. Well, that's not describing any Christians. That's not us. Well, how about the second half of the list? See if you find yourself in here. Hate, fighting, jealousy, fits of anger, uh -oh. uh, contention, rebellion, divisions, envy, drunkenness. Hmm. Maybe we are there a little bit. And if you've read this week's chapter... 
there's a question asked by Bevere. When should I leave a church? When should I act and not react? Because sometimes we do that. When we get in a situation, we just react without thinking of what's going on. The word, continuing on with chapter 8 of Romans, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The big question is, when is it spirit and when is it flesh? Because we can put in our own mind, God can be telling us, stay, stay, stay. But our reality, we want to say, go, go, go. We want to run. And besides military transfers or moving to a different state, I've only left two churches in the last 54 years. One was by what I perceived was wrong, how I was treated, accusations made. And I, I ran. I just left, never to look back. But I thought it was all them. But during that time, I matured and realized it wasn't anybody else. It was this guy right here, this guy speaking to you. I, mat I matured through that. And the second one, I actually did leave on, on good terms. Virginia and I have been talking about going to a different church, moving closer to our our home, and there are many good churches in Olympia area, and so we, we thought we'd, we'd move to one, but you know, the timing was never right. We just didn't want to leave our friends, our ministries, our works, our challenges. Uh, uh, we were invested. She'd spent 20 years over there, 18, 20 or 21 years. I spent like 18 years there. So we were invested in our church body, but yet we, we, we felt like it was time to move, but the timing was never right. And so then COVID came. Many of you, are, if you went to, were at churches, your church is closed down. Well, it's only going to be two weeks. <laughs> yeah, just two weeks and so no problem. So we did, we did two weeks of online messages, online singing. And we just, it wasn't there. We weren't fulfilled. We need, we need people. We need a body. And I had I'm an in-person person. In-person person, that's right. So we were waiting for the right time, and after a few weeks, I had, I had sat down with my pastor. I had talked to him, and I said, you know, when this, this two-week lockdown is running into months, I said, when this is over, we are most likely going to move across town. We had a church picked out. We knew some people there. We wanted to go there, and the lockdown continued. Then we heard about this, this, this small group that was just meeting out in an open field, and we went, and there we were, an open field. We brought our lawn chairs. There was a fire going, and then later on, we got a, a, a small Costco garage-type tent, and then we got a bigger tent, and then we got a gigantic tent, never intending to be there for two years in a tent. Although it did have hardwood floors if you were there. They're, they were they were little chunks all pushed, just spread out. So that, that was our hardware chair. But, you know, I, we left on, on good terms because we let them know that we are going to be leaving. And, of course, here we are with Church in the Woods. It wasn't a church. It was just a group of people gathering. Now, we did move to the other side of town, although we were thinking west, not the southeast. So we're totally on the other side of town. But we're here, and we did it because we were we were waiting for God's timing, and the timing was right. So here we are, and <laughs> as a camper, Church in the Woods was perfect for me. <laughs> I was like home. So Bevere, after he defines uh, mature and immature Christians, believers, he states about immature Christians, they often react react emotionally, or they respond intellectually to circumstances rather than through simple obedience to God. Now, I'm not one that's opposed to intellectual re responding. I, I rather like thinking. But following the leading of the Spirit far surpasses any human reasoning. So we make His Spirit and listening to Him first, and then we ponder it. We think about it. We, we search to know him. Revere says that spiritual growth comes from obedience, not time or learning. Now, there were a couple of areas in the book that I kind of disagreed with, uh, not vehemently or anything. 
I agree. Obedience is more important. But certainly I wouldn't discount time and learning. And as Chris says, the wall of wisdom. They've walked with Jesus for a long time. That's important. That's important. <laughs> And as far as knowing God's word, unless we know his word, how can we obey? We have to search the scriptures and hide his word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. That's how we can be obedient, is knowing his word. So it's not some magical thing where it's, you just so follow in the spirit. And we have to know his word. And in regard to time, we live as believers Sometimes in successful obedience, and then other times in utter failure. So maybe I'm just talking about myself, but I know that my worst failures in my Christian walk as a believer, embarrassing, humiliating, brought me closer to Jesus. Because I had to fall on my knees in repentance and, and really look at my wickedness and turn. And that's what repent means, is to turn. And how can we turn if we don't really see our wickedness and how evil we really are? And so those, actually, my times of non-obedience, and I'm not encouraging being disobedient. It's hard to mature that way. But in your failures, that's where you can grow if you repent, if you humble yourself, if you come before him asking for forgiveness. And so... That's where I changed. That's what completely changed my course in following Christ. I'm a big reader, and the reason I've read a lot of books is because I was really messed up as, as just a person. Um, one of my favorite books is from Pete Scazzaro, The Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I don't know if anybody else has read that, but it's excellent. It affected Rick and me so powerfully, we actually taught it at our last church. Uh, Scazzaro stresses that we cannot be spiritually mature unless we are emotionally mature. What, a, what an odd thing. When Rick and I took the book's maturity um, survey, we were shocked what? right out of our socks at how immature we were. We were. And we were old we were in our 50s, and you would think 60s. that the number, the number of the birthdays that you've gone through would have some effect on your maturity. <laughs> oh, no. We couldn't, we couldn't agree. We couldn't fight fair. We couldn't get along. It was, our marriage was a disaster. And the reason was, was because we were immature emotionally. And we didn't start growing really mature spiritually until we started growing mature emotionally. And we didn't even know we were emotionally immature until we read this book. So the question is, are you yourself mature, emotionally mature? So here's, here's a quote from Scazzaro, and I want you to think of yourself and your own behavior. Do you fit this description or this definition? Scazzaro says that emotionally healthy adults... They can ask for what they want, clearly, directly, and honestly. They take responsibility for their own thoughts and their feelings. They maintain their own beliefs and values without being adversarial. They respect others without having to change them. They give people room to make mistakes. All right, you perfectionists out there. You know who you are. They appreciate people for who they are. They can assess their own limits, strengths, and weaknesses. They, oh, here's a big one. They don't lose themselves in other people's drama. That's a big one. We have a tendency to get way caught up. I was one of those. Now, now I get accused of not caring. It's like, you don't care about me. You're not getting involved in all my drama. It's like, you're right. It's not mine. It's yours. I've had enough of my own. Thank you very much. 
Mature adults can also resolve conflict maturely and negotiate solutions while considering perspectives of others. And that's where he and I had the biggest problem. We never shut up long enough to listen to one another. We were too busy defending ourselves, always up in arms waiting for the next attack. Here's what happens all too often. We fail to be emotionally healthy adults. So I love that statement on page 64 in our book that said, acquiring an offense. So isn't that interesting <laughs> verbiage? Acquiring. I'm, I'm, I'm acquiring this. I'm taking it. I'm getting it. Acquiring an offense keeps you from seeing your own character flaws because blame is deferred to another. It's easier to blame someone else than to take responsibility. And I, I was the queen of that for about 30 years. Bevere says that latching on to an offense and deferring the blame to someone else creates this false sense of protection. It's fake. It doesn't work, it doesn't last, and it's not real. It's an illusion. It keeps us from seeing our own character flaws, and we never have to face our role, our immaturity, our sins, because we only see the offense of the offender. I was married to an alcoholic. Yes, I am divorced. And I used to go to AA and Al-Anon meetings and cry about how he was so mean. And one time they said, well, you sure, you sure have a problem. I said, yeah, him. They said, nope, not him, it's you. You choose to believe his lies, you choose to stay, you choose to uh, engage, you choose to try to control him, you choose to worry if he's going to come home, you choose all this behavior. He doesn't make you do that. And I thought, I'm the victim. <laughs> They're not very loving. <laughs> but I, I chewed on that. People can't say something to me without me listening to it and chewing on it. I might not react right away. You might think, well, she didn't hear me. Believe me, I took it home and I thought about it. And I realized they were right. I caused my misery. All of it. 100%. It didn't matter what his behavior was. I caused my misery. So what Brevere says is, we filter everything through this lens of offense. And that affects how we see everything. The question is, what if your lens is blurry? What if your lens is inaccurate? That taints everything you see, and it might not even be true. So he says that we need to allow truth to have its way. We need to have, let, let truth have its way in our lives if we're going to grow and mature. Otherwise, we're not. Unfortunately, we don't like the truth. Sometimes, not always, but we really don't like the truth if it goes against what we believe. So we simply create our own truth. In turn, this creates our reality. I had built a total lie of reality in my own life and lived that way for about 30 years. Caught in depression and misery, you know, I call it familiar misery. I was familiar with it. I knew what to expect every day. So did I bother to change it? No, because I knew how to deal with it. A false truth creates a false real reality, and only real truth can set us free to really live in real reality. We have to know the truth. This begs the question, what creates our truth and our reality? Anybody? What creates your truth? Any idea? What makes your truth? Lord. That's good. It should be the Lord. But all too often, our truth comes from what we tell ourselves. I've heard people say, oh, so-and-so doesn't like me. Well, did you ask so-and-so if she likes you? Well, no, I can just tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even true. Yeah. It's what we tell ourselves that determines what we believe and how we behave. Everything is about our own personal narrative. So remember the, the little engine that could? I think I can. I think I can. He's going up this big hill. And he did. But how many of you are I think I can't people? I think I can't. I don't think I can do it. Well, guess what? You can't. You cannot. If you tell yourself you can't, you believe that lie, 
and therefore you can't. So, reality and truth don't have anything to do with the outcome because it's we ourselves, what we tell ourselves, that determines the outcome. In, the chap in chapter 3 of the book of James, he tells us, oh, excuse me, I need my hanky. <laughs> Rick always has his. I have mine right here because I, just, I might oh, weep. Right. I, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> James says, he tells us all about the power of the tongue. I'm sure you've read the book of James. It's the power of the tongue. Ooh. Who can tame that tongue? Anybody? Who can tame your tongue? You can. <laughs> Jesus can. So in cooperation with Jesus, we can tame our tongue. In his book, uh, You Are What You Think, Dave Stoop says, self-talk refers to our belief system or patterns of thought. He has five basic principles of the foundation of self-talk. One, our thoughts create our emotions. Our thoughts affect our behavior. It's not what's occurring in our lives that affects our behavior. It's what we believe about what's occurring. It's what you believe about it. We, and then he also accuses us of, of thinking irrationally. You don't think irrationally, do you? Never. Never, never. But the solution is we create change in our lives by gaining control of our thoughts. And the battleground is in our mind. One last quote. Tim Cameron in his book, The 40-Day Word Fast, which I've done more than once because my words aren't always great, he argues that bondage in life is often linked to our words. He says those words are words of, oh, ouch, judgment, criticism, sarcasm, mm. negativism, complaining, and gossip. And they should have no place in a Christian's life. Can you all see how blessed I am? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I, I am blessed. You know what she talked about? Oh, suffering. How much of it is brought on by ourselves? And that question was asked, what are you learning about suffering, about obedience? And I, I, can, I can tell you that I've suffered enough because of my own self. But years ago when Pastor Chris asked me to join and be part of the, the, the elder team and serve, I am glad to serve. I'll, I'll wait on tables, I'll bring food, I'll come early, I'll make coffee, I'll just do, I'll greet, I'll pray. But then he, an elder has to be able to teach. I, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You want me up here? You want me to teach other people? No, that's, that's a game changer. I'm, I don't think I can do that. I, truthfully, I don't want to do that. And it, it took a while for me to mature enough to say, okay, God, I will humble myself. So now I've learned to be obedient. I've learned to say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. And I will, and I have grown spiritually very much. Sometimes Chris has to use a cattle prod to push on. No, not, not really. But you know, with our immaturity, it's not just, like Virginia says, not just our age. She said she, we were in our 50s while well, I was in my 60s, okay? So I'm a slower learner than she. But sometimes we become spiritually blind to what's going on around us. You know, the, of course, we heard the word, the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. We see sometimes what goes around us, but what are we really seeing? What about our battles not against flesh and blood, but spirits and principalities, darkness of high places. You know, we talked about the voter guide today, and you look at the list and you think, oh, but you'll find one that there's no recommendation. No different parties, no one's really set, no one's really focused. So there it's just like you vote for who you want to vote for. But I think back to 2 Kings in chapter 6. There was a time when the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And at, during that time, the Syrian king would tell his, his commanders, his leaders, his top staff, okay, this is where we're going to go, and this is where we're going to trap them. And yet, the man of God was telling the king of Israel, 
they're going to be right there. So go around a different way. And he was so, the king of Syria was so frustrated. Somebody in our group is telling, telling the Israelites where we're going to be. We're going to find out who's for them. And one of his servants said, Master King, it's not anybody in your leadership. There's this guy in Israel, he's a prophet, and he's telling the king what's going on. Because what you speak in your bedroom, and you thought it was only the government, is telling him. So Elisha knew. So Elisha would, so when the king found out, he said, we've got to get this guy. We have to go after him because he's, he's just revealing everything about us. We can't hide anything. And so one morning, Elisha's servant works, wakes up and he looks around and the Syrian army had snuck in at night. Army, soldiers, horses, chariots. And all he could see was, we are in deep trouble we can't, and he told his master, he said about it, and Elisha looks around, and he looks at his servant, and he just asks God, God, would you open his eyes that he can really see what's going on? And all around the mountains were horses and chariots of fire. God's army was protecting him. He would, God was protecting him, even when they came into, this, into town. Elisha prayed, God smote him with blindness. He led them out in the middle of nowhere and then opened their eyes and there they were surrounded. And they said, should we kill them? No. No, don't, don't kill them. Let them live. And when I suffer now, because if you're like me, there are sometimes we suffer. We go through things, things we didn't plan on, things we didn't expect. What do we do? Do we raise our hands and just, oh God, what am I going to do now? Where am I going to go? Who can I think of? Who can help me? Now, we, Virginia and I, we've, we've traveled a lot. We've been on a lot of different roads, kind of like that. We'd, we'd be somewhere. Oh, wow. We've never been lost here before. Let's explore. God, I've never been here before. You know, help me learn. Help me experience what I need to know because I do want to grow spiritually and emotionally healthy. Yeah, whenever we have a detour or a delay, we just call it a divine delay. delay. It makes us grateful. So what are some other ways you can grow in maturity and live in reality? Bevere says that we have to face the hurts and attitudes that we don't want to face. We have to stop running from them. So let's just say that you're offended. Pete Scazzaro, he encourages us to... Well, first, get the facts. How many times when we're offended we, do we actually get the facts before jumping to conclusions? He says, every time I make an assumption about someone who has hurt or disappointed me without confirming it, I believe a lie about this person in my head. Rick and I had such awful problems at the beginning of our marriage, and I'm a grumbler Call me a Jew. I'm a controller. Uh, he's a controller. I'm a grumbler. <laughs> and the more names I called him, the more I saw those names in him. And I read a book and she said, is he a good-willed man? Ooh. And I had to say, yeah. Then stop calling him names. Is she a good-willed woman? Yes, she that. is. <laughs> I don't know about that. So we believe lies about people, and it's all in our head. He says, this assumption is a misrepresentation of reality. When we leave reality for a mental creation of our own doing, we create a counterfeit world. Oh my, I lived in a counterfeit world for so long. When we do this, it can be properly said that we exclude God from our lives because God does not exist outside of reality and truth. That is so powerful. Bran Hansen in his book, Unoffendable, love that book, called Unoffendable, very similar to what we're reading now. He says, are we really honestly aware of just how little we actually know about other people? God knows their motives. We don't. He knows our private motors, motives. We don't even know our own motives right. half the time. 
We think we can judge others' motives. We're wrong. And, and so he says, instead of changing our beliefs to match reality, so I have to be flexible, change my beliefs to match truth, to match reality. Instead of doing that, we take the easy way out. We rearrange reality in our minds, in our, in our heads, to match what we want. We simply can't trust ourselves in our judgments of others. The, the Bible says the heart is wicked above all things. So we can't trust ourselves. Hansen says, let's choose ahead of time then. We're just not going to be offended by people. And that's what this book is about. And I love this part. If I, I love this. If I don't need to be right, I don't have to reshape reality to fit the story of my rightness. Right. Oh, that's yeah. so good. It is so good. So what practical ways can we live in reality rather than in our created counterfeit world? As Bevere would say, we live in truth and we obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that's not so easy. I mean, it's not some magical thing. We have to know God. We have to pray. We have to humble ourselves. We have to seek him. We have to listen. We have to know his word. Amen. Yep. You know, the scripture talks about choose you this day whom you will serve. I love that word choose. It's not just a right, you know, to choose, you know, how that's been twisted and morphed. Well, I get to choose every day to get out of bed. I get to choose what I eat. I get to choose what I believe. I get to choose what comes out of my mouth. I get to choose. So he says, choose what you put in your mind. Scripture says, think on these things. What's that beautiful list? Such a beautiful list. Things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, or worthy of praise. Think about those things. What do you think about? You determine what you believe by what you think about. So, therefore... If you think everything is terrible, guess what? Everything will be terrible. Because that's what you're looking for. That's what you're believing. But if you think on that list, he shows you how to change your mind. In his book, The Power of Your Attitude, can you tell I've read a lot of books about your attitude and how you think about yourself? Yeah. He says... It's a stand toller. He says, you cannot choose what happens to you. Yep, sometimes life happens. He says, but you can choose how you respond to it. He asserts that what you think, I think this is amazing. He says, what you think literally determines your identity. And what you say, what comes out of your mouth, determines your reality. He claims that negative thinking is more than a disease. It's a pattern, a rut that's etched into your brain from years and years of practice. I was raised in a home with an alcoholic mother, and I had negativity in my bloodstream. And condescending parents and judgmental parents, oh, they love to just judge every person that walks by. Oh, they, she's got ugly written all over her. You know, both my parents... I grew up with that. It's hard to wash it out of your system. Mm -hmm. If our brain is dirty, we need some brainwashing. Yes. We wash yes. it with the Word of God. Good, good, good. One. Wash it with the Word of God. He says, it's more than a disease. It's a pattern. It's a rut. So what's your rut today? Where, where do you feel stuck in your own thinking and holding on to an offense? Peter Scazzaro's wife, okay, so this couple wrote two books, and his wife impacted me more than even he did. Me too. Jerry Scazzaro. Her book is called The Emotionally Healthy Woman. Changed my life dramatically. She says that when we quit what she calls faulty thinking, so remember, we're creating these narratives in our mind. It's faulty thinking. She says we choose to live when we stop. We stop the faulty thinking. We choose to live in reality. She says that when we make blaming statements, we create the illusion of helplessness. Who mistakenly believe we don't have choices. 
That's who I was for a long, long time, a victim. It's, it's my mom, it's my upbringing, it's my whatever. Ha, ah, ho, hum. Like, who else hasn't had to deal with that? I'm nobody special. She said, we make these blaming statements. We create the illusion of helplessness. We don't believe we have choices. And blamers play the victim and often retain a sense of moral superiority and sometimes moral inferiority, thus disowning. Here's the result of that. We disown taking responsibility. It's all about taking responsibility and not blaming other people. So again, uh, Hansen in his book, Unoffendable, says, choosing not to take offense. It's a choice. It's not about simply ignoring wrongs. It's about choosing to act. And how do we act? What are some tangible ways? Without contempt, without anger, without bitterness. And that's maturity. Bridget, she had mentioned about being in a rut. And I remember my pastor, my first pastor years ago, talked about a rut because a lot of us young men were coming in and we were in this, stuck in this, these ruts. And he always said, a rut is nothing but a shallow grave with both ends knocked out and you stink. That was it, basically. And she's talking about choosing. We get to choose how we, we act. But more importantly, we get to choose how we react. Because one is a thought process. The other one's just, just go for it. So what is... What will you choose? Where's your life source? Is it your past experiences? Past wounds? Past experiences? What about a past spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Oh, they treated me wrong. They did this. They did that. You're stuck somewhere sometimes. We all get stuck. But we have to choose what we want to do. Do we want to be the, the victim or we do want to be the victor? Do we want to lose or do we want to win? When you obey God, your attitude will be, yes, Lord. When you semi-obey, it's going to be, why me? And if you don't obey, say, oh, me. Because you're going to be in trouble. Not by, not by man, but God's going to speak to us, our hearts. And he has a way of, as Virginia says, you, or it been, she mentioned many times, Beth Moore said you can either bend the knee or he can break the knee. And I, I, I don't want any, broken, any more broken bones. I've had more than enough. In my, in my shop, I've got a lot of signs in there, a lot of different things. It says beware or beware of. Oh, just be aware. Or I'm, I have several different signs, but there's, I've got a big beam and a big header has different signs. And there's one sign right in the middle that is the most prominent sign. It says, attitude is everything. Choose a good one. Because what we think, what goes through our minds, what comes out of our mouth. If you think negative, negative is going to come out. If you think negativity in your actions, your actions are going to come out negatively. But eventually, their reality is going to come around. We talked about blaming. <laughs> blaming is so much easier than taking responsibility. Oh, oh they did it. Who, who's they? I've, I've been looking for them for a long time. and I, I, I pointed them out, but I never could figure it out. But blaming is much easier. I mean, it's much easier than looking at myself, introspection, you know, it's, it's, it's better to see others' faults. And our individual's experiences, our beliefs, our, our attitudes, they shape the reality of what we define as truth if we don't use his word to see what is, thy word is truth. Your word in my heart, it helps me. So what does the Bible talk, talk about blaming? We, if you read the chapter, there are many verses in there, many different scripture references so I just decided to choose a few, but I'm going to just talk about a couple. One is Matthew 7. Basically, it lets us know that however we judge, we get the same judgment. That's it in a nutshell. That's just Rick Leggy con conversed, confined. Chapter 5 talks about, it tells us to clear up our misunderstandings or offenses before they become an offense. 
You remember you part about taking your gift to the altar, then come back, go make it right, and then come back. And Luke chapter 6, I'm going to read this, verses 36 and 37. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I am quick to forgive for two reasons. One, I made a lot of mistakes, and two, I still make mistakes. I, I, you may think I'm good, but I'm not perfect. That day will come. I know it's just it surprises her. That day will come on Resurrection Day. Then I'll be perfect. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil. I've been there. Have regard for the good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. Or we could say give place to wrong, to offenses. For it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. And in so doing so, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not come over, come evil, but overcome evil with good. Back to 2 Kings chapter 6. They could have slaughtered the entire army. But no, he said, feed them. Give them drink. Send them on their way. You know, they heard you all saying, kill them with kindness. And that's exactly what they did. James chapter 4. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. And just to make it clear, sometimes the Bible doesn't say men, women. It just says brethren or, or whatever. When he says men, he's talking to mankind. When he says brethren, he's talking about his brothers and sisters in the Lord. So he can't go over that. But don't speak evil of one another. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and the law and the judge judges of the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Virginia had said it, and I'm going to go ahead and say it again. I don't know another's thoughts or intention, nor do they know mine. Because we all have in our mind, well, I can... I can judge them by, their, by, by the, what they did and judge myself by my intention. My intentions are much more pleasant than what, than what they're doing. But we got to stop blaming. When we're wrong, we take responsibility. We repent. We seek God. We make things right. So we got to stop judging, stop blaming, and look at ourselves. Is that tough? One of, the last, one of the last things Brevere says in his book is love forgets wrongs so that there is hope for the future. Am I the only one that got stopped at that sentence? I guess I am. Okay, I'll explain. So love forgets wrongs. Does this mean that, unlike what Hansen said, we're ignoring wrongs? Mm. Or do we somehow have... Spiritual amnesia. We forget. I don't know about you, but personally, I'm not able to forget things. Does that mean I don't forgive? No. I think that trying to forget, forget excuse me, to forget an offense is unrealistic and it's simplistic. It only can cause us, you know, what people say, well, forget it. Why don't you get over that? Because wounds are, are deep. They can be deep. They're legitimate. They're real. And I would never discount somebody's offense, somebody's pain. So when people say that, or, you know, or that they think they're quoting the Bible that we're supposed to forget, all it does to me is it causes guilt because I can't manage to forget. Mm -hmm. Anyone. Um, let's see. So many offenses are real, 
in their deep, and they must be taken seriously, while others are truly perception. We have to know the difference within our own selves. What is a real offense and what is just purely perception? So I think Brevere, he kind of backs up, and he encourages us towards spiritual maturity by confronting offenses. Those would be the real ones and the imagined ones. And he says, use the guidance from the God spirit. We can work through difficulties and thereby heal relationships simultaneously while we're growing into maturity. I think only God can forget. That's right. I grew up with a lot of pain in my life, and, and I was chronically depressed for about 20 years. And I just thought, well, I'm just a melancholy person, kind of like Eeyore. <laughs> when I was healed, I realized that in real healing, you're completely changed. And you don't forget the offenses. You don't forget what happened to you. You still remember them. I mean, they're in our brains. But they change. They change. They, don't, they lose their power over us. They lose their grasp. They lose their influence. They lose their grip of pain. I can remember that I was in pain, but I can't even remember what it felt like. That's how healing is. I remember I was sorrowful, but I don't remember. I, I can't identify with that. I don't feel sorrowful anymore. So we know we're healed when we just, we can remember the event, but we can actually say, I'm kind of grateful because those events, those things made me who I am. God used those things to make me unique and uniquely able to help others in the same situation. And we can be grateful. So in my personal life, the worst things that happen to me are the things I'm actually the most grateful for. That's when you know you've been set free. You don't forget. You remember with gratitude and let the healing take place. So Jesus is the one who wants to heal our wounds. Unfortunately, we often don't let him. We don't let him heal us. Because it's a difficult road to take. It's a difficult walk. It means that's why Freedom Session is nine months. Because it's a difficult road to walk through all that healing and all that time. And grief share. It's a difficult walk. It takes time and it takes confrontation. Confronting things that are painful. Revere says... That when we take this road, it's the path to, of humility and self-denial that leads to healing and spiritual maturity through obedience. So I have one final question. Well, okay, I have several final questions. Are you willing to do the hard work? You know your life. I don't. So you know the areas to work on. Will you walk the path of humility and self-denial? Here's a big one. Do you want to be healed? You know, people look at me and say, what a ridiculous question. Of course I want to be healed. What do you think? I want to be miserable? Yeah, yeah. actually. Because it's easier to make excuses. It's easier to blame. I lived there for a long, long, decades, long time. Because it's hard work to face your fears and what hurts you. He says, will you obey God's word even when you're offended by others? Will you seek the truth and reality so that you can mature spiritually and reap those rewards and have peace with God? And really, you have peace with yourself and you have peace with others. I have always found that it's much easier to run away from conflict than to face conflict. I was a runner that caused our problems. <laughs> <laughs> she caught me. <laughs> she brought me back home. <laughs> and I don't like, like conflict. I still don't. But I have learned to face it. Look it head on. If there's a misunderstanding, let's get this mis misconception, this misunderstanding cleared up. If I have offended you, I'll ask you, did I offend you? Did I do something wrong? Because if we're immature, we don't approach it. 
we hide it. We under, we, under the rug. Yeah, we, we can, had a huge lump under our rug. We removed the carpet now. So, <laughs> yeah. but if we're immature, without even realizing it, the offender is controlling us. And the offender probably doesn't even know, doesn't think about it, doesn't care about it. But here we are rolling it over in our mind. This person did that. This person did that. How can I get even? How can I carry it out? How can I get with them? And those, those offenses, they either do two things. They either they hold us back from growing, going forward, from growing to mature, or they move us and press us forward. I'm going to overcome that. You know, I, myself, I know there's probably many in your room, your, your parent, your dad, your mom told you, oh, you'll amount to nothing. You won't be anything. And we believe that lie for so long. And then one day we're thinking, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be that person. And then by the grace of God, Christ comes into our lives and makes us a new person. Amen. 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 So I was thinking about Ecclesiastes chapter three. Are you familiar with it? A time for every season under heaven, time to be born, a time to die. There was a couple I thought about, a time to kill and a time to heal. There is a time to kill the offense. There is a time to be healed from the offense. And you can't do it any better than by the blood of Christ that has forgiven us. So we forgive others. And the other one is a time to tear down. Tear down what? Tear down every false imagination tear down every stronghold that has us bound and allow us ourselves to be built up, a time to build up. As Jews said, build yourself up in the most holy faith, which is in Christ. With all that said, we have not arrived yet. But I'll end with this. As Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal, the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's all press forward this week. And as you press forward, if you have the book, I encourage you to read chapter 7. This one here is called the Sure Foundation. What a better foundation than on the rock, Christ Jesus. In the front of that chapter, there's a little saying. I've read this book before and I've gone back through it. And this one here had the most impact on my life because I've lived it and I've realized it, I've experienced it. It says, what we learn in the presence of God cannot be learned in the presence of men. We draw closer, we learn more, we grow more when we are in his presence. Because like Virginia and I, we've heard thousands of messages, thousands of sermons, heard a lot of people talk, but unless God grows us, we're trying to do it in the flesh and we can't. Let's all stand. If you'd bring up the Lord's Prayer. We know it, but we'll say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Press in, press forward. Thank you.